in my gym, I have a lot of pictures of kind of bodybuilders, nice black and whites that I enjoy. And there's just a real clear difference between mm. Frank Zane, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, Sergio Oliva, um, to, you know, Jay Cutler and Ronnie Coleman and, 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 and I don't know when that jump took place, maybe Lee Haney, maybe, um, Dorian Yates, but somewhere in there, there was a real transition in physique yeah. and, um, it, it, not to debate which of those is the best. I think everyone can have their own preference for which era of physique was the most, you know, was their favorite, but what, what is the, you, you know, if you sort of think of the, the things that can impact your physique genetics. Okay. That's not changing. Uh, nutrition and knowledge of nutrition, that's clearly evolved. Training and knowledge of training, that's clearly evolved. Um, drug use, that's clearly evolved. And then maybe just even injection. I've talked to bodybuilders today who say that they're actually injecting compounds in their muscles to alter the shape. Mm. Um, they're, in, they're injecting like fats into muscles to actually create some sculpting. So that again, that's probably something new. Let's put that one aside. As far as the like when you so of the three evolution of training evolution of nutrition evolution of drugs how would you rate the relative balance of those three for the difference of you know a 1970s physique versus a physique today of the best bodybuilders in the world probably <laughs> drugs at the top almost certainly followed by I would say nutrition probably, and then training at the bottom. And how, how much emphasis on each of those? Like 50, 40, oh, 10? That's tough because these get scrutinized to hell. Because yeah, it's yeah. like, I'm going to put a number on it. People will be like, how do you think diet is only 20%? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, because um, a lot of these things don't live without the other. So you could definitely lean heavier and yeah. say, well, if you eat nothing, the drugs aren't going to do anything. So I would say just in order of importance. Fair if you did perfect diet, perfect training with all of the modern knowledge that we have now, your ceiling for muscle growth potential could be as much as 50 to a hundred pounds lower as a natural, depending on height, depending on genetic response. And by the way, I don't want to forget on the GH stuff. One thing that is interesting is even in acromegalic patients, the incidence of death seems to be cardiovascular, almost like significantly more than cancer incidents. So if there's anything to discern from actual human literature, it's a good point, significantly chronically elevated IGFs into even, f you know, 40 years old, these individuals are dying from um, congestive heart failure and things like that, as opposed to, and that's really interesting. So not even atherosclerotic disease. It's, they're also probably, I, I have to look into this. Actually, that's a very good point. I should look at the acromegaly literature. The, one of the interesting things is how much fluid retention they hold and the stress that has on the heart too yeah and that's very interesting they also probably would be i'm guessing maybe more prone to aortic dissection because they probably have larger connective tissue um, and things like that yeah okay so you're putting drugs at the top of the list and then nutrition and then training i think was the order you had them in so let's talk about the drug use so i've spoken to 70s bodybuilders mm. and was if they're being honest with me, and I have no reason to believe they're not, right? Like, what do they care? You would think. Yeah, like, what do they care? I was shocked at how little drug use was going on back mm. then amongst the best of the best. Yeah. And and we're talking like one to 200 milligrams of testosterone a week. Yeah. Eight weeks at a time, you know, eight on, eight off, eight on, eight off. One to In other words, they're basically taking TRT. Yeah, they're not telling the truth. You don't, okay, so In that's your opinion. view? Most of them, almost certainly or not, when you're saying you're taking a like borderline female HRT Dianabol dose, it's like back then, that's what it was prescribed for, um, or like muscle wasting in old age or whatever. Some of the old like SEPA Dianabol ads are hilarious, by the way. But those dosages are almost impossible to wrap your head around producing outcomes that they are, like you might as well have stayed natural almost at that point. So. You know, I too bought into the idea of, oh, they seem to have consistent stories. They seem to have all taken one shot of Primo a week and, you know, one to two Dianabol or what have you. And it's, 
just not an outcome that you see as reproducible ever in those dosage quantities. So, you know, maybe on the hyper extreme outlier scenario, you might have a guy who a total weekly dosage of, you know, a few hundred milligrams across everything he's using, he may hyper respond and get huge. But I would say the majority of the guys competing at the Olympia level were still like I've heard of people slugging D ball by the bottles. Like it's even back in the 70s. Yeah, the it's just 80s. certain people are more outspoken about, you know, their abuse than others seemingly. And it seems like the ones that are outspoken are more like this guy, Pete Grimkowski. I don't know if you've heard of him before, mm -hmm. but looked incredible. But the guy used like thousands and thousands and thousands of milligrams. And I can understand why you would arrive at that logic to take that because there was nothing to tell you otherwise. So if you're competing against a guy at the highest level and there's relatively high stakes, you see a guy like Arnold getting movie roles and stuff. It's like the peak of achievement as a bodybuilder back then. You couldn't do social media. You couldn't do anything. You would try and emulate presumably what he was doing or something of that nature. To think that you're not going to escalate your dose past one to two Dianabol and a shot of Primo or what have you or a shot of Nandrolone because you didn't want to like hurt yourself. It's like, shut up, dude. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I heard I saw a video kind of recently of Tom Platts discussing this. Oh, he had changed the story. Yeah. With that said, his original breakdown was relatively conservative still, but he's done public presentations about drug use back in the 80s, 90s. And he, you know, you could tell he was pretty reserved even back then. He handled the situation very delicately. You could tell he was picking his words carefully as he spoke but more recently he came out and said his dose was like i don't know a third of that or something and it's like okay maybe like you know in 40 years or something i don't expect you to remember exactly what you took but to say your peak dose was one third of what it was i don't know like i just i just don't really believe you well at the other end of the spectrum i've spoken to one bodybuilder who and i couldn't believe it <laughs> but he said at one point he was up to are you ready for it? Yeah. 50 grams of <laughs> testosterone <laughs> like, in a no, week. That's, no, there's no way. You would not inject that much. I, I mean, I, I was like, how is that possible? You would run out of injection sites. How are you managing? I think a lot of people just don't know what they take too. Yeah. Because oftentimes you ask people on TRT even, what's your dose? They're like, oh, I took like, you know, a half as we noodle with patients between 100 and 120 milligrams a week like literally we would we will make mm -hmm. movements that fine 20 milligrams a week yeah yeah i think a lot of people they just go by oh my doctor told me to take this much of a syringe and then they kind of just remember some rough number but oftentimes they don't know how many milligrams per milliliter what they're using is they don't know what their dosage is they just take some scheduled protocol and they stay on it for years and then they don't even know what they're doing. But 50 grams is like, it's impossible. Like you, just, <laughs> you, you would have to dedicate your life to injecting, essentially. <laughs> like that would be your full-time job, just sitting there pinning like 5 to 10 cc barrels of test all day. Oh, God. Yeah. So um, given how remarkable the physiques were in the 70s at the top of the, you know, at the top of the food chain in the Olympia, you, would you agree with me that it's a different like something dramatically changed in the late 80s, early 90s? Yeah, and it seems to be the emergence of growth hormone and insulin abuse, as well as the escalation of drugs to an even more extreme magnitude and the availability potentially. Like granted, they were prescribed readily seemingly, but people also seemingly push the limit more and there's the emergence of underground lab preparations and things of this nature. So um my understanding at least is and there's no literature to document like oh you know this dosage equated to this and therefore this is why it happened but it seems to be dose escalation of anabolics to some extent but more so the implementation of growth hormone coupled with exogenous insulin use and they're using insulin because of how anabolic it is it, well <laughs> that's the uh that's the the goal is what they think it is and obviously if like there's terminology that may not be exact on that but it's like that is uh what they believe it's doing is shuttling a kind of like super physiologic amount of nutrients into the muscle because also when you take gh you are acutely insulin resistant so 
you need a little insulin to overcome that. Yeah, they're almost like doing both things at the same time is the goal. And often when you're using really high doses of GH, and fortunately this isn't as problematic in replacement dosages, so I don't want people to extrapolate out, oh, GH equals you know, chronic insulin resistance necessarily, but at the dosages people are using, they will, they could induce, you know, diabetes essentially. Like you could end up a diabetic from just your GH abuse. And oftentimes to relieve stress off the pancreas and the beta cells, they will use exogenous insulin. So you don't have to produce as much endogenously to actually accommodate the amount of carbohydrate intake and just overall nutrients. Because these diets get to, you know, to maintain a 300 pound physique, you're pounding 500, 5,000 calories a day sometimes. Mm -hmm.